very happy to introduce our next speaker, who is uh, Dr. Ulrika Buchen. Um, and uh, she's going to tell us about uh, convergence results for discrete conformal maps based on conformally equivalent triangular lattices on circular patterns. Let's give her a good welcome. Thank you very much. Um, and I first want to thank the organizers for this um, nice and inspiring conference and also for um, giving me the opportunity to talk here about some results I got um, on conversions. And um, I want to, uh, to start um, to go back uh, with and start with conformal maps because um, when I started my study in mathematics, I first got fascinated by complex analysis and of course by these conformal maps which are well studied um, prominent objects um, therein and what's very beautiful about or what I like about um, objects and complex analysis is that they come with various characterizations and flavors and for um, this talk here um, what I need is the characterization as infinitesimal scale rotations mm. And um, this works also a little more precise, so we can either see conformal maps, which are normally defined um, as with non-vanishing derivatives, to just be um, infinitesimal rotations, so preserve all intersection angles, or on the other hand, we can look, for, um, look at this from a more metric viewpoint and just consider them as to be an infinitesimal uniform scaling at every point. Um, now later on in my studies I learned about discrete objects and I also fell in love with them. Um, so now I tried to reconciliate both worlds um, by describing a link which is not only on the qualitative but more on the quantitative side so by really approximating given smooth conformal maps by corresponding discrete ones. And historically, there are lots of discrete versions of, of the corresponding smooth ones. So we heard about lots of discrete versions for Laplacians, um, for Evans talk and Max talk and um, other talks. And um, I want to study only two notions of discrete conformal maps. Uh, which um, and then reverse historical order. So I start with the newer ones, which are based on conformally equivalent triangular lattices, which we already encountered several times during this conference. And um, then for the second part of my talk, I will switch to the older ones uh, to uh, circle patterns, which we saw in the talk of Alexander Bobanko on Friday. And my, my aim is always to present you some um, approximation and convergence results for these maps. So let's get started for the, um, and I will first um, remind you what, recall what um, are conformally equivalent triangulations. So now my viewpoint is that I first want to discretize my pre-image domain. And for this, I now take a triangulation in the first part. And um, I also have to tell you that, the, um, as you might have guessed from the picture <laughs> on the previous slide, I'm only considered with com conformal maps in the plane. So we are just stay in the plane and I will also be happy for simplicity with simply connected and very easy <laughs> simple <clears throat> um, topology. Um, now the such, two such triangulations are called conformally equivalent, so they will be for in my from my point of view, there will be just pre-image and image of a discrete conformal map. And of course, um, one easy thing to ask, one obvious thing to ask is that they have the same combinatorics. And if they have, then I can, as a, they are just triangulations, so embedded triangles, I can just define a piecewise linear map on these triangles and study this. And I, I also want this to be a rotation preserving and the local homeomorphism, just that my map is an um, immersion, yes, I, as I would um, have it on the smooth side. But now I have to also to um, 
um, formulate the conformality. And we've already seen that if you uh, um, use the metric review point, then this amounts just to, um, to changing length in a certain way. So we assume that we have these scale factors, which were infinitesimal for the smooth case, just as you know, real scale factors sitting at the vertices and they just scale the length of the edges. So um, if I have any edge in the pre-image, then the corresponding edge is just um, scaled by the when such a sort of mean of the two scale factors um, at the vertices. Um, now, this is very nice. To, to observe because um, this allows us to construct specific images. So I want to approximate a specific given smooth conformal map later on. And now these, these scale factors just tell me how to obtain the triangles in the image triangulation. So given them, I just can build up all these triangles, glue them together, and then, then I have this image triangulation. Um, which I take it as a, then this correspondence as a discrete conformal map. Um, now we already heard and then there are some drawbacks of this approach, although it's very nice and near to the smooth case because the, their conditions on this use, you can't take them arbitrary of course, um, include the triangle inequalities. So if you prescribe any use, um, of course, you won't get a nice triangulation, but in, in, um, often you won't get a triangle at all if you don't take um, uh, the right ones. Though this is the first obstruction um, if you want to stick to this uh, definition and to the um, combinatorics. But if you have this, um, then the second um, necessary condition which you want to have is this local embedding. So um, obviously if you can build all your image triangles, then you can lay them out in the plane and you, if I only consider the planar case. Now, as I told you, I want these angles in the image triangle to sum up to two pi. And then what's nice for me, because I want to study the, the function later on and prove approximation results is that there is, of course, an analytic expression for all these um, angles and the triangles given the edge length, and we can use this later on. And um, now, from my point of view, when I worked with this closing condition, it's not very important um, what this function is, but you remark you have here these differences. And now, um, in, from my point of view, this recalls uh, the definition of a discrete Laplacian. So for me, from the, the behavior of this equation, this is some sort of nonlinear discrete Laplacian. Um, and from this point of view, it's very natural if you want to construct some specific image triangulation to, to um, use directly boundary conditions for this. Yeah? Um, and therefore, this is the first natural problem. So we, we want to um, give them some pre-image, which we take, which um, my picture will be this here depicted. Um, now I, I'm given a smooth conformal map and I want to construct the corresponding image pattern from boundary conditions. And then I just take the corresponding smooth quantity with the logarithm of modulus prime. And I, I have to guarantee that I can find all the scale factors in the interior. So I have to um, take care that the triangle inequalities are always satisfied and also then the closing condition. And the first, uh, the nice result is that Bobenko, Pinka and Springbrand observed that you can um, take this, this uh, closing condition and that it's just um, the gradient of some um, locally strictly convex functional. And therefore, we can in practice solve this problem by just um, plugging in the boundary conditions and searching for this um, u as minimizer of this functional. Um, the problem is, on the other hand, that uh, you don't know that if uh, such a u exists, okay? So um, 
the, we we don't know if we can um, if the triangle sex um, triangle inequalities are satisfied. So we might have the, um, degenerate triangles, and then we can't use this straightforward approach. So nowadays, um, and we also heard this in previous talks. Nowadays, you uh, you can overcome these difficulties by changing the combinatorics. Yeah. So um, so you can, in some sense, always uh, find a solution for this problem, but you lose your fixed combinatorics. And for me, so um, for this talk, I want to stick to the combinatorics. And um, um, so for simplicity, we will assume that um, we won't change the gun in this and just see if we can come around um, somehow. And um, it's nice that I could find out how to do this. So um, let's consider the theorem. I start with a given conformal map. Then I choose some compact and simply connected region in its domain. This is just where we want to approximate our conformal map. And, um, and then of course, as I told you, I have to um, discretize in the um, the complex plane. Now, for discretization, I will be very happy with a very regular one, which is a triangular lattice. And I only take those which have acute angles, and this guarantees that we are Delony. So they are really nice triangles all over. Um, and um, then I scale the whole triangulation by some parameter, which will be our discretization parameter all the time. And then um, as indicated here, I within this whole triangulation, I take a subcomplex which sits um, inside my chosen compact domain and which will which will take as a um, approximation of our um, pre-image domain. Yeah, so a discrete pre-image domain. Um, and then I could show that um, the, the scale factors really exist, um, uh, satisfying these boundary conditions. If the, the, this parameter epsilon of the triangulation is small enough. And um, um, how did I do this? So the, the main idea which I used is the following. So um, at the boundary, we're given this condition. So it's exactly what we have in the smooth case. But for the, the interior vertices where, where, we, where we are in search of the right scale factors, uh, let's take also this logarithm of model loss of f prime um, as a good guess. And then um, you, can, you can take um, these numbers as scale factors and lay out the triangles yeah, around um, one flower. And then what you observe, if instead of the, the right values, you epsilon, you just take this guess from the um, given conformal on map is that you have an error, of course, but this error is very small, only of order epsilon to the power of four due to the lattice structure. And now what you're doing is to, you, you change, you slightly um, change your guess by adding some um, nice functions of order epsilon squared, um, such that you have some something which um, is similar to sub and super harmonic functions and which allows you then in the end really to capture <laughs> the right scale factors um, in the middle. Yeah? Which in, in my feeling correspond to the harmonic solution of this nonlinear Laplacian. So this is just um, the, the main idea of the proof, how I could show that these scale factors and exist. And um, if we have found these scale factors, of course, um, now we can build um, the corresponding image triangulation. 
and uh, normalize it according to our given smooth function. Okay, so why assume that um, the origin is point of my given domain and so I um, normalize at the origin. Okay, so this is um, the first step. We, we got the scale factors and we got some discrete control on map. And now we have to prove that it really approximates the, um, our given smooth map. But um, I already indicated that we, we um, how, to, how I did this. <laughs> and because um, as I told you, starting from these directly boundary conditions where I really prescribe the right values on the boundary for our scale factors, um, I took this um, logarithm of f prime as a guess in for the interior and showed that the, the, the solution is um, in between order epsilon squared of, of this, um, this guess, this first guess, my Taylor expansion and some um, 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 use of this, um, this um, convex functional. And um, this gives us a very nice um, uniform a priori estimate on the difference of the smooth and corresponding discrete quantities. And this you can then use and prove that also the, the values of the function <laughs> differ by only order epsilon and their um, first derivatives. Okay, so um, for this case, we really obtain um, on very nice and good approximation from this uh, directly boundary conditions. And now you may ask, um, okay, we really started with a very, very regular um, um, triangulation of our, of the complex plane or of our domain. Um, can we do better? And of course we can. So we um, now had for C infinity convergence, and um, to this end, um, I took, um, I was inspired by a paper by um, He and Ashram, and he took um, uh, a sideway and considered some other quantity. And we will also switch around, and I'll tell you that you can characterize this conformally conformally equivalent triangulations not only by the scale factors but also in a Möbius invariant fashion and this is due to the cross ratio because for every interior edge we take the incident triangles and then you get a quadrilateral obviously and you can calculate these cross ratios by starting at one of the endpoints of this edge and it splits as every complex number into two parts. So you can consider its modulus and that's um, the length cross ratio, or you can um, just consider the, the unitary number which uh, encodes the intersection angle between the circum circles. Um, and it turned out that um, the, for our conformally equivalent triangulation, the length cross ratios are important because you can show that the, the two um, triangulations are conformally equivalent if and only if for all interior edges the length cross ratios agree. So this is in some sense a, a Möbius invariant um, characterization. Um, but um, what's even nicer now for our convergence result is that these cross ratios are related to um, smooth, to other smooth objects, well-known ones. And these are the Schwarzschild derivatives, which are also invariant are the Mobius transformations in some way. Um, such that the, the uh, Schwarzschild derivative of every Mobius transformation vanishes. And the, if you postcompose a function with the Möbius transformation, then the short chain stays the same. And what's important for our case is that you can really obtain the um, short chain derivative in a smooth case by considering cross ratios, as here in the bottom formula. If you consider any quadrilateral with some vertices I called A, B, C, D. And, um, and then if you um, 
if you consider and then if you fix your point a and, and then consider the scaled versions by epsilon of this quadrilateral um, then the cross ratio uh, stays the same of, of the quadrilateral but um, and then you consider the corresponding image point and build um, it's cr their cross ratio and then um, what you get if you take the limit epsilon to zero then you get the smooth Schrodinger times some factors which depend on your uh, quadrilateral and we will take this as a basis to define some um, discrete Schwarzschilds. So we just take for any interior edge the cross ratio of the um, pre-image triangles, um, which are rather boring in the lattice, and then the corresponding cross ratio of the image um, triangles adjacent to the corresponding edge and subtract one and then we normalize it um, by epsilon squared as in the smooth case because we always consider parts of the lattice which is scaled by epsilon and then we can call we, we I call this discrete Schwarzschild it's not really a discrete Schwarzschild because it um, depends on the direction so it's some projection of the discrete Schwarzschild depending on the edge direction in fact. And um, so why is this discrete Schwarzschild especially nice? <laughs> so uh, what I liked about this it is um, that if you now not only consider one edge but the flower about a point say um, then the corresponding discrete Schwarzschilds on these edges they satisfy an equation and you can formulate this um, um, and you can formulate this in in um, um, a way that if you take the the cotan Laplacian of these discrete Schwarzschilds so the the very usual Laplacian we know um, with respect to the um, pre-image lattice and then what you get out is a polynomial in terms of all these Laplacians and epsilon um, and this is very nice because um, then you can uh, use this and prove um, some regularity <laughs> yeah, because um, the, the Laplacian is nice and you can prove some regularity and get um, the C infinity convergence out of this. Um, so this is why I considered the discrete Schwarzschilds and then we can now um, come back to our theorem and just um, um, get these, these um, additional convergence of directional derivative of all orders so we can consider either the discrete Schwarzschilds yeah, and um, consider any discrete directional derivatives I know um, along any path here and then show that this converges and also um, this is also true for the the discrete conformal map F then. Okay, and um, with this um, I finished for, for the first um, part of my talk. So this is, um, this finishes all, so this sh shows the uh, all structure um, you might wish to get out um, of this approximation with the very nice and structured lattices as pre-image. Um, and um, just um, um, as a side remark, I want to um, observe that, of course, these discrete conformal maps are tightly linked to surfaces or so special surface types. And I also um, like very much um, minimal surfaces. And so there are discrete Weierstrass formulas related to um, at least uh, all the, the discrete conformal maps I know and I just wanted to mention that there is of course also one formula relating to this conformal equivalent triangulations 
um, um, then you can get discrete minimal surfaces and approximate them. If you can, if, you, if your map approximates a smooth conformal map, then of course, um, due to this formula, you can show that you also can may approximate discrete smooth minimal surfaces by corresponding discrete minimal surfaces. Um, and I just, um, this is not my picture, but by courtesy of Wei Yang Lang. Okay. So this is um, for my first talk, uh, for my first part, are there any questions yet? I think Aaron had a question. Um, if, um. Yes, yeah, sorry, um, thanks. Um, yeah, I was just wondering how small is small enough in, right, so you say for some small enough epsilon that you have this nice convergence result you can look like give bounds, but how, do, how small do I need to be before I know that I'm close to what I want? So the, the what I was concerned about is that um, if you, um, if you build up your image triangles, then um, um, the triangle inequality need to be satisfied. So what you have to guarantee is that that um, if um, um, in, oh, I'll see if I can go back, perhaps. Um, let's see here. Um, so um, no. I wanted. So what I what um, all this is about that that I take in fact I I cheat and just uh, try to take the, the smooth value as scale factors and um, at at the corresponding vertices and um, um, then the theorem tells me that. If I'm good enough, then I'm order epsilon squared away from the the right guess. And so, um, what's important is that that the triangles exist. If um, at least if I plug in these smooth values, and then I have to um, still think about some order of epsilon squared. So I haven't um, thought about giving really tight bounds because this is just, for me, it's just a theoretical result. So um, if I can take epsilon finer and finer, then uh, for once it will work out. Um, but this is the, um, what is this about? So the, the triangle, um, I, the tri I need the triangle inequalities to be satisfied and then we'll be fine. And um, um, we can calculate um, the right um, conformal factors um, from the energy functional. Okay. So now I um, switch my my um, focus a little, and um, this can be considered in, in several ways. And so I will start with um, this Mubius invariant characterization. And there you can consider this as a switch from the length squares ratios, which characterize to come formally equivalent triangulations, just to the these unitary numbers, which are um, in fact, just give um, the interior intersection angles between circumcircles. That is, if you um, consider this from a viewpoint of um, triangulation still, if you have two triangulations with the same combinatorics and um, um, just add the circumcircles, I've, as I've done here in my little pictures, um, then you can consider the case that all these these um, circums the corresponding circumsurfaces which correspond to um, incident triangles have the same intersection angles. And this amounts just um, to compare the arguments of this cross ratio. Um, and um, but um, this also shows that uh, this picture also shows that we will in fact consider another um, combinatorics 
combinatorial background, which is better than just in these triangles and their circumcircles, because what's really important is this yellow region, um, which is bounded by the, the circumcenters and the intersection point. And it turns out that you can have a more general combinatorics out of this, and that we will switch, in fact, from uh, triangles and triangular triangulations uh, to some quad combinatorics now. For the second part. Um, and um, so that my main object are in fact kites. So always if I have two intersecting circles, then I can build the corresponding kites from circumcenters and intersection points. And I see this, um, this is it's the exterior intersection angles sitting here and opposite intersection points and the kites. And therefore, what I take now as a basis um, combinatorial structure is um, quad graphs. Um, and I also want them to be bicolored because I want to know which will be the uh, circumstance and which will be the intersection points. And important, and for me, I only consider the planar case, so everything will be planar. And then um, I read off the second ingredient which I need from my um, little picture above is some intersection angles which I will prescribe because now I have this viewpoint on um, conformal maps being not um, infinitesimal scalings but now they will be just maps which preserve angles. And we will preserve angles at these black vertices. So this will be the intersection angles and we will prescribe them beforehand. I call them a labeling. And then of course, to have such a nice embedding as I've drawn here, this labeling aren't arbitrary, but we have to guarantee in the first point <laughs> that um, these intersection angles add up to pi around every interior black vertex. Um, and um, now, okay, now we have um, this combinatorics and this intersection angles, and then we can build up a circle pattern with this combinatorics um, if we have all these, these um, kites and um, they may be glued up um, in a way that I can add circles around the uh, white vertices and through the back black vertices. And um, um, just note that I don't count any intersection point between circles, but only um, the black ones, which are important for the intersection of um, specific uh, circles I'm interested in. Yeah. So in, in fact, what underlies a circle pattern um, from my point of view is more a kite pattern, you know, where I can read off all my information. And often I use the circles more for um, visual beauty. Um, and uh, circle patterns may be really beautiful. <laughs> um, they are, have been studied in several aspects now. Um, I won't go to into history, but um, we will be concerned with isoradial circle pattern as a special case where all the circles have the same radius. And here we have some a symmetric example. I indicated um, one um, symmetry part here. Um, and of course, it's um, clear what I will define as a discrete conformal map based on circle patterns. So we just take two the circle patterns with the same combinatorics and the same intersection angles. And then it is corresponding, this correspondence um, of the circumcenters and the intersection points and the kites um, will give us a discrete conformal map. And we can also have um, a real smooth, uh, no, a real continuous map as for the um, conformal equivalent triangulation by just splitting the kites um, in the middle, say here, and then taking um, the piecewise linear function. Okay, so this is, these are the discrete conformal maps. And um, then, of course, um, 
you might now ask, um, how can I approximate this? So can I come up with some uh, specific so-called pattern, which um, um, gives rise to some, or will then approximate, um, help me to approximate a given smooth conformal map. And for this, I will also use um, a functional which um, characterizes this this uh, circle pattern and one thing you one may use are the radii because I know the intersection angle so if I now know also know the the radii I can build up this kite and lay them out and get a specific circle pattern and it turns out that this radius function is really really nice um, so of there has one there's one closing condition which has ob obviously um, been satisfied um, this is around um, the white vertices so if we um, build all these kites then uh, we can lay them out and they have to um, close up around in this void vertices so the angles have to add up to 2 pi um, around the black vertices we all already guaranteed this because we chose our laboring accordingly and now um, what I in some sense forgot to mention because it's so easy is that um, for any um, choice of radii we always get a kite so we don't have this additional problem we had in the for the conformal equivalent triangulation that we have um, the, there we had the triangle inequalities to be satisfied and now we can really choose arbitrary radii and always get these kites and you just have to uh, guarantee that they close up around um, white vertices and of course there is an analytic ex expression for the closing condition so you can of course calculate these angles in terms of the radii and the intersection angle and um, the, um, I studied circle patterns before um, I studied conformal equivalent triangulation and also here um, I had the impression that this is very similar to a nonlinear um, discrete Laplace equations um, equation and um, this is also um, um, shown by the fact that we have a Dirichlet principle which is now um, far more easy than for uh, conformal equivalent triangulation. So given any um, circle pattern which we um, have built up to approximate our premise domain say, so we have, can read off its, its um, quad graph and uh, the in intersection angles of the corresponding kite pattern, then we can now prescribe any value for the radius function at the boundary, anything you want. Um, and then you will be able to obtain um, a suitable radii for all interior vertices here. At least if you choose to cho choose this uh, quad graph, um, um, or the, the kite pattern to be um, 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 topologically like a closed disk. Okay, so we I won't um, consider complicated topology in, in this talk, but um, just to, to simply connect it. And if you do this, um, then it's really nice that you can always achieve the, um, such solutions for the directly boundary conditions. Yeah, you can prescribe anything. And um, um, then you may ask, okay, can we then have a similar convergence result as before? And of course we have. And um, due to the, um, um, so we will see that it's very similar to what we had, but a little more general in some sense. So I start with the conformal map and the compact um, simply connected region. So this um, I here only depicted um, this compact case. So the, the function is defined in some um, neighborhood of this. Um, and now as a discretization of our uh, pre-image domain, we not only take some lattice this pattern, but we can take uh, isolated circle patterns. 
Um, as they are isoradial, so all the radii of all circles agree, and we will take a sequence such that uh, which decreases to zero. And um, then um, this gives us more freedom in the combinatorics. I should mention, as we had in the previous case for the triangulations, because I only considered regular triangulations, and here we have this uh, isoradial circle patterns, which are more. Um, general, but I um, want to restrict the intersection angles and bounce them um, uniformly away from zero and pi. And if I do this, um, I can construct an image pattern by just prescribing uh, corresponding radii at the boundary. So I, um, as in the previous case, now I I take the corresponding scaling, which I have infinitesimally for my smooth maps, um, just as a finite scaling here. These are the, the radii for the pre-image domain, this epsilon n, and um, the corresponding scaling gives me the radii of the image domain. Um, and then it turns out that um, you can, um, so you now can construct your image pattern and um, uh, normalizes, of course, according to the values of your given function. And um, then you can show <laughs> that it also converges. And then you can also start with this um, the, the, this idea that you take your um, radii in the interior to be, to be a, um, the, um, as a good guess to be equal to the original radii multiplied by the modulus of f prime. And um, in fact, um, I could show uniform estimate that this is really the case um, everywhere. And that's, um, and that's really good guess everywhere. So it's a um, uniform estimate of order epsilon n. And um, as we don't have this regular structure, I um, don't have a higher order, the same higher order as before. So if you have a lattice structure, you get higher order, of course. Um, but um, nevertheless, you have this uniform estimate and yet you deduce the, the convergence of the discrete conformal maps from that. And um, just as a side remark, um, in this case, um, I, I only studied these um, directly boundary conditions, but of course, you can also study um, Neumann boundary conditions. And so um, you you can um, consider so um, a, a corresponding um, change of of um, rotation and prescribe um, something is some rotation at the boundary. Um, this is also very useful for um, minimal surfaces, for constructing distributed minimal surfaces. And I could also so show that this also converges you now with some um, very similar approach and um, similar estimates. Okay, so you have um, in some sense a dual also working here in this case. And of course, um, we already saw that, that this um, Circle patterns are linked to, uh, have a known link to um, minimal surfaces, to discrete minimal surfaces. You know, so here, if you take Neumann boundary condition, you can get um, examples like this. Um, and now for the remaining part of my talk, I want um, to switch um, away and to, to consider one specific property, which um, um, Ivan Ismestev mentioned several times, namely that if you have something, um, you uh, if, if in the smooth case you have a Laplacian, um, then the the corresponding harmonic function satisfies a maximum principle. And I um, have told you that in my feeling these uh, closing these equations is described closing conditions. Um, may be thought of as a non versions of discrete Laplacians. And therefore it's very, um, oh, sorry. Uh, it's very nice that um, we have a maximum principle which is satisfied um, and which is uh, 
relatively easy to prove uh, for um, embedded circle patterns. So um, just to state it, if you have um, so embedded circle patterns with the same combinatorics and the same intersection angles, and you consider the radii of corresponding circles, um, then if you know that for one pattern, all the radii of boundary circles are bigger than for second one, then you can deduce that this holds everywhere. Um, and this is a very nice property and very, maybe very useful. Um, and um, then what's even nicer is that you can extend this to a hyperbolic setting. So I could, I have um, considered, so these, these patches, I only considered up to now these finite patches of um, um, circle patterns. Now assume they are both embedded, have the same combinatorial, same intersection angle. Um, then I can assume they are embedded in the Poincaré disk, yeah? um, like indicated here. And if they are part of the Poincaré disk, um, then we can, instead of Euclidean radii, we can now consider hyperbolic radii um, for the, the same circles. Now we forget about the Euclidean circumcenters and so on, but really consider the circles on their hyperbolic radii. And, and then it turns out um, that the, the similar statement is true that if the hyperbolic radii of the boundary circles are bigger for all circle, boundary circles, then this also holds in the interior. And it's even stronger that if you have um, strict inequality at one boundary vertex, um, then we have strict inequality for all interior vertex. Um, and now um, you can even generalize this further. So this is an idea um, used by Schramm for proving rigidity that you can consider not only packings which are within the Poincaré disk, but you can also allow circles to intersect the boundary. Um, so for the easiest case, assume that one of the circular patterns um, have boundary circles which intersect the boundary, then you, you can call them um, infinite, <laughs> right? Um, the big, and um, then you can show that if also for all interior vertices, the radii of these first circle patterns are bigger than for the second one. Um, and um, okay, now. Yeah, this is nice, but this concerns hyperbolic radii. And normally, we can we um, were interested in the Euclidean ones. Now, note that if you consider some finite region within the Poincaré disk, say half the radius here, um, then you can compare the hyperbolic and um, Euclidean radii up to some constant. And um, by doing this, this um, constituted the, the main ingredient to um, some rigidity proof. So if you now assume that you not only have these finite patches as I always considered, um, but um, infinite circular pattern within the um, Poincaridis say, and I apologize very much because I only <laughs> can do finite patterns. So you may have to, uh, have to uh, extend this in your imagination to some circle pattern which really fills the, the disk. Um, so if you have uh, such a pattern with some combinatorics and um, some labeling for the intersection angles, and if you, um, if these, these um, uh, circle patterns um, or the corresponding kite patterns are locally finite, so they're, they're no, nowhere in the, the interior, there are infinitely many um, circles um, around, but they cover the whole unit disk, then this is essentially unique. Now, so um, they might be different, but the, the only difference is a hyperbolic isometry of the, the Poincaré disk. Okay, so um, um, yeah, so this is some nice result. 
um, which extends um, results of, of Hay. Hay, who first considered this for some other configurations of intersecting disks. So this is a, the version for the uh, circle patterns. And um, I was very happy that I had no restrictions on the combinatorics and on the labeling other than the pattern to be locally finite. Um, you want to have the same also for the Euclidean plane. And um, it's here, so you can nicely imagine, for example, this um, regular pattern to be extended to the whole plane. And here um, in my proof, I had to bound the angle from below. So you choose some combinatorics and uh, some intersection angles, but the, the angle of your infinite pattern um, are such that the, the triangles don't degenerate, so they're uniformly bounded. Um, of course, I also want to have uh, to be this, um, have this locally finite and cover the whole plane. And then I could show that this is also essentially unique. So two such patterns um, differ only by Euclidean similarity. Um, and now, um, for the, the last um, part, I just wanted to, um, to give you um, another um, a convergence result, uh, which has a slightly other flavor than the one we've seen um, so far, um, because I won't be related to the directly principle. So, um, assume you are given um, two simply connected bounded domains. And um, assume now that you don't want to construct circle patterns by a specific uh, method like uh, directly from Neumann or whatsoever, but that you have chosen your favorite method and that you have um, obtained some embedded circle patterns for the, the two domains, okay? Um, and that they have the same combinatorics and the same intersection angles such that you can have the con construct a discrete conformal map. Um, and um, now assume that they approximate from the interior are two given domains, which I assume are bounded for simplicity. Um, uh, and by approximating, I mean that the kite pattern um, really approximates the domain um, in house of distance. And um, that, um, in, and additionally, I assume that th the angles in the count kites are uniformly bounded away from zero and pi, such that nothing may degenerate uh, from this point of view in the whole sequence. And um, then the only two ingredients I still need is that, um, okay, for one of the patterns, say the pre image pattern, <laughs> I needed. Uh, the radii to decrease to zero, so that it gets really finer and finer in some precise sense. And then I need um, one point anywhere um, where um, I want this to uh, this um, um, discrete map to converge. And um, then what this approximates, or what it should approximate, of course, <laughs> is the Riemann map. Yeah, because uh, you fill these two domains and um, you get finer and finer, but you first have to prove, of course, that the, the radii of the image pattern also um, decrease. Um, um, and, um, and then, of, so we have convergence at one point, but uh, still could rotate about this. Um, so. Uh, we have to extract a subsequence if we want to have convergence, really. Um, um, yeah, there, there, um, we can really do this and obtain this um, Riemann map um, from the, on the two domains. Okay, and there, there um, has been a result, um, the corresponding result for um, um, circle packings by Herrn Schramm and and so now I could generalize this to the, the, the case of um, circle patterns also and show that it works and that um, 
and one of the the main ideas of the proof is to bound the uh, the quotient of the radii of corresponding vertices. Um, this is done with this um, hyperbolic maximum principle uh, to show that that really they are bounded such that the discrete conformal map I consider here are in fact um, continuous quasi conformal mappings and then um, if you have this then you have to just arrange for showing that in the limit case it will be conformal. Um, and with this, I want to thank you very much for your attention. And I hope that you fascinated by this convergence as much as I am. All right, thank you. Let's thank Dr. Buki. And uh, we have time for some questions. Oh, I can. Oh, Tianxi has a question. Go ahead, Tianxi. Oh, yeah. Thanks very much, Professor Bokin, for the nice, uh, great talk. It's, the results are really deep and impressive. Yeah, I want to confirm I understand correctly. Did you generalize the Professor Hu's result, rigidity result, to the case of intersecting angle between 0 and pi, from 0 and uh, half pi? Um, you mean you mean here uh, for the for the planar circle pattern rigidity result? Yeah, I um, think it's here. Yeah, yeah. So so I I could um generalize this little um I um the the nicer result is for the the um hyperbolic plane there i have no restrictions on the angle but here i still have one. Oh, you um, have and, um, no. um, and and um, notice that that um, he uh, the, considered some of the circle pattern which i have here like this regular one but he considers um other configurations of circles so it's not really the the same uh, thing so he um, so in his case, he had additional restrictions to to the the way he he thinks of circles, and so the circle pattern um, case where you really prescribe this intersection angle and have this kites uh, simplifies um, some uh, okay. some cases. Okay, so the kites are special uh, cases of his um, circle patterns. Can I see that? He considered yeah, yeah, more general yeah, yeah, yeah. cases, he, he, general family of he, call, he considered another family which has something in common, but uh, but oh, uh, for oh. some way they are different, really. Oh, they're different. Yeah. Okay, okay, thanks. Yeah. Okay, uh, Hannah. Yeah, hi. Thanks for the great talk. I was wondering, I mean, you stressed quite a lot that you want to work on simply connected domains. So I was wondering how bad does it get when you when you take let's say an annulus or something like that. I have to um, <laughs> I have to to um, um, say that I haven't thought about it at all. <laughs> but uh, I was very happy by by um, considering the simple cases. Um, um, yeah, this this is an important case. <laughs> Uh, thank you for mentioning, but um, I haven't an answer yet. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Max has a question. Yeah, thanks. Um, thank you, Ulrike, for this for this very nice talk. Um, so you mentioned it several times, like you know, like a version of a nonlinear Laplacian because essentially you said you had to get directly a principle. Do you also have like an energy for, for this? So can you characterize the solutions of what you call the directly principle as a minimizer of some sort of energy? So for the, I, I don't know, I'm not sure whether I understand your question because the, the, two, um, the two cases of, uh, I consider they are the, the solution I always get from some energy. 
So okay. when the, uh, I mentioned this for the conformal equivalence, but there is also some energy for the so-called pattern case. And mm -hmm. the um, relation to the Laplacian can also be made um, explicit if you do a Taylor expansion at some point um, and insert some um, conformal map. Yeah, so do you just um, consider some epsilon um, um, a part to some some vertex, um, any um, combinatorics, and do and Taylor do a Taylor expansion um, of um, this closing condition. Then what you get out, um, for example, in the in the um, triangular case, you get uh, the well-known cotan Laplacian, and um, here you also get the cotan Laplacian. Um, well, it's not that easy to see which um, it, which angles you take, but it's it's essentially the cotan Laplacian plus some um, error. Right. Okay. So so you actually do have an energy, and that's yes. what you. Yes. What you yes. yes. So I got it upside down. Sorry. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> thank okay. you for the question. Um. Well, if there aren't any other questions uh, right now, uh, let's let's thank uh, Dr. Buki again for a great talk, and.